Some of the um, police chiefs around the nation have been saying that uh, George Floyd is going to change policing. I think this can be one of those moments wow. where you have this moral outrage. <laughs> It's been an emotional, just journey for this year, just a year. Yeah. Oh, you mean with all everything, the everything, pandemic everything and everything? For people. It's I've, just been I've probably emotional... cried more in these last two weeks than I've cried in like a couple of years. Wow. Yeah. You know, just seeing the video and it's really sad. memories I've had of race, racism that I've experienced, and you know, it just bubbled up. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And, uh, well, welcome everyone to the School of Greatness podcast. We're super excited about our <clears> guest today. Uh, the inspirational Reverend Michael Beckwith. Thank you so much for being here, my man. Appreciate you. We've had you on before, and it was one of our favorite episodes and interviews and people keep talking about today. And we are in an incredible time right now where there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of frustration, and there's a lot of miseducation, especially by white people. There's a lot of white privilege that has been unaddressed. And I think for millennials, have a lot of a lack of education and understanding. And I wanted to bring you on because you are such a leader of spiritual hope and inspiration and you, you're rooted in love. And I think that's mm -hmm. what I appreciate about you the most is your principles and guiding um, root of love. And that's what I want us to talk about today is how can we be more loving as right. a society? How can we be more loving as human beings and how can we be a solution to the problems in the world right now. And I, I wanted to ask you first, just how are you feeling? Hmm. You know, right, right this moment, I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. You know, I guess over the last couple of weeks, I probably have cried more than I've cried in a couple of years. You know, just, just witnessing the atrocity and the, the public lynching that we all saw, mm -hmm. you know, obviously brought, brought tears to my eyes. Uh, and every time I see it, it's still a visceral emotion about that because it brings up memories as well of me growing up and, and experiencing you know, that, that, kind of, uh, that kind of racism. Not that kind of racism, but racism, period. But, um, for, for, for white people like myself, yeah. who most white people have probably never experienced any type of racism right. the way that you have, uh, in, in general I'm speaking, what are some of the types of things that you had to face growing up to give context to people like myself who never had to walk down the street, you know, wondering if someone's coming behind you, a police officer or... All of that. You know, in the, edu in the education, uh, I can remember being graded down in my papers because I was, we had to, we had to write like a, a future autobiography. So in junior high school, I wrote, I was going to follow in my father's footsteps in law, go to USC, do X, Y, and Z. And the teacher said, you're never going to go to USC, you, 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 you know. Uh, she dimmed my hope. I mean, I went to USC, by the way. I went to Morehouse, <laughs> I transferred to USC. But I can remember her saying that people like me, I shouldn't dream that big. I remember telling my mother about that. My mother went up to the school and handled her business. What year is this or what year? This is junior you? high school. So this is back in the uh, 60s, yeah. you know? Um, people like you, meaning what? People? Black people. Wow. You know. Did she say black people? No, she said your people, something like that. Wow. I remember her name. I'm not going to say her name. Yeah. She's probably passed on or maybe she's had a great change. Who knows? Okay, so that's the educational piece that, that, that was that was. That was in school. It was in school. Okay. You know, I was on the track team in high school. Would jog around my block, pulled over by the police. You know, where, where are you going? I got my sweatsuit. I have my L.A. high. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm jogging. I'm on the track team, you know. So my mother would make us go down to the police department and file a complaint. That was a part of the rules of our family. Wow. You know, you, you, if a police officer stops you, get their badge number, file the complaint. Now, if we didn't do that, we got in trouble. You know, so, so my mother and dad, you know, basically had to talk with us about how to get home safely, how to deal with police officers, yes sir, no sir, get the badge number, file a complaint. Mm. You know, so that was just part of our upbringing. And this is in the 60s, you know, and 70s. 60s, yeah, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, I mean, I could, I could give you, I don't want to go down that whole list, but I remember at Morehouse, Morehouse College, you know, we rented a, a hotel for a party. You know, it was like a, 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 our own version of a frat party. Mm -hmm. And um, police came, I remember, it threw me and my guys up against the wall. What are we doing here? He says, we rented, we have a room. 
you, you can't have a room here, you know, and threw us up against the wall, arrested us for um, criminal, what was it, uh, some hmm. kind of, um, this is mischief or something, I don't remember what it was. But they're essentially finding a way to make you wrong. Right. Yeah, so I can go down the list. When I, right before I started Agape, <clears throat> I spoke at a, a community in a Fullerton. The congregation overwhelmingly wanted me to be their minister. I said, I really don't think I'm a fit for this, but I'll, I'll be a guest speaker. <clears throat> they really wanted me. Threw my, my uh, name into the hat. Congregation wanted me, and then a small group of people mm. started saying that if we bring this black man to be the minister of this church, the property value is going to go down. People are going to no start way. parking their cars on the lawn. There's going to be litter and trash everywhere. You know, and they started this whole thing. And what's interesting about that is that the people in that community, which was mainly a white church, they didn't know that their friend that they were sitting next to was a racist. All the racists thought that everybody was thinking like them. And all the people that were progressive and just into, you know, loving humanity thought everybody was thinking like them. But I show up and everybody gets revealed. And so I eventually said, no, this is not my place to be. And uh, I, I started Agape. And um, hmm. when interesting. Did start, when did you start Agape? 1986. Wow. So right before that, that particular church, it was a big earthquake, split. And they had the Fuller, the Fullerton Church. Wow! <laughs> it split. They had to evacuate their building, and then uh, uh, eventually they hired this woman. And they hired a white woman really fast. They wanted a little diversity, so they hired a woman, and then <laughs> she stole a bunch of money and left. Oh man! So all the things they were afraid of happening hey. happened by a white woman. Wow! <laughs> you know. But anyway, I, we, I don't need to just. This recap. has happened at every stage of your life. Oh, absolutely. From education right. as a little boy to right. high school to college to right. in the workplace yeah, right do you feel like when you after you started agape you know for the last 24 years now do you continue to feel racism in la you as, know as a, a leader in spirituality as a, a leader of the church as a leader of humanity agape we're in our 34th year 34 years yeah it's a um extremely diverse community it's a, it, we wanted to build, um, be an example of the beloved community that got Dr. King talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, where all people are worshiping together, serving together, growing together. So I'm kind of in a little bubble where that's concerned. So, right, right. Um, and because I'm kind of known, I don't really have a lot of um, things coming at me in, in that way. Uh, I know it's there, you know. And the beautiful thing about the space of agape is that people come and we get to deal with those issues. Like very soon we're going to have some, some dialogues where people are going to be able to just come together. Like after <clears throat> um, the Rodney King situation, after certain things, the community comes together. Now, that, now it'll be on Zoom comes together and actually talks it out. Mm. You know, they talk about privilege, they talk about how it feels to be black, how it feels to be a woman, how it feels to be gay, you know, whatever the case may be. So there's, it's a safe space for people to really get into the conversation and not avoid it. And then take ownership of perceptions that you might have, mm -hmm. that you may have inherited from your parents or whatever, and begin to dismantle and transmute that. So. I, I do know that racism is alive. Racism is still alive. I mean, it's, 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 it's systemic mm -hmm. in the in in the culture. I mean, when you look at it from a historical context, you look at 1619 when when the first I, I don't like to call them slaves, like this say uh, um, forced immigrants. Mm -hmm. You know that that they turned into slaves, arrived. And the United States wasn't even a union yet. You know, it, it took these um, Africans to uh, Virginia. Thus began slavery. Now the idea was, in order, in order to um, justify it, the good Christian people at that time had to say they were less than human. They were like a horse or a dog, wow. you know, cow. So that way they could abuse them because they're not really abusing a human being. They're abusing these people from Africa that aren't human. So that became a part of the narrative within the fabric of our society. Mm. So then when slavery um, was abolished, then you had the Jim Crow era. You had public lynchings of black men. The point being, laws have come into effect to stop 
segregation, Jim Crowism, public lynching, slavery, etc. But the underlying narrative is still active in many people. So at this particular time in our human history, you see that the, the, the veil has been lifted. So you actually see racial superiority. You see the, 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 the supremacists rising up, being very bold, like they were in Charlottesville, very <clears throat> bold about who they are, primarily because of who we have in the office at this time, making it easy for that to show up. Why do you feel like they're showing up that way? I think, I think it's, it's, it's two reasons. One, we're in a moment of, we're in an apocalyptic moment, the apocalypse, which means, apocalypse simply means the lifting of the veil. When you lift up the veil, it means what was hidden is now visible. Mm. So all these things that have been hidden for a long time or denied or people saying you're exaggerating, we can now see it. <laughs> right, right. You know, saying, oh, this was just, I'm seeing all these videos saying if it wasn't on videotape, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't even believe it. Oh, Sean you're exaggerating. This, you're not... making that up. Yeah. You know, so I think because of the energy of people on the planet who have been praying and <clears throat> meditating and doing spiritual work, the planet itself raising its vibration, things are easier to be seen. And then we have this um, evolutionary trigger who's like a transformational Mr. Magoo in the office who incites a lot of things so it becomes easier to be seen. So people feel emboldened because of who's in office. Say, so, oh, you know, he's like, it's like a dog whistle. <laughs> you know what I mean? He says certain things, they're like, okay, let's go rally, you know? And uh, so all of this can be seen now, which was hidden before. And, and so that's the good and bad news. Yeah. The social, good, me social media as well being yeah. a landscape for people, every person to have a voice publicly and, and show these things. Right. So the good news is we see it. Mm -hmm. You know, the bad news, it exists. The good news is once you, you can't heal something <clears throat> that you're denying. If you deny that you have cancer, you know, no, that's just a pain in my knee or whatever, and you know, go check. You know, if you, that's not gonna heal it by you denying that, it, that you have an issue. You have to actually examine it and see it and then provide what is necessary for your mm -hmm. healing. Mm -hmm. So now that we can actually see um, abuse of power and force by police departments, uh, we can actually see racism. Now we can begin to have a conversation as to how to dismantle it. And, and I think that's the time we're living in now. Yeah. So that's, that's, the, that's, that's the good news mm -hmm. of the protest. What's the bad news? The bad news is that the, the narrative is being hijacked by violent anarchists that are primarily white, you know, yeah. that, that are trying to steal the narrative of the fact that uh, this man George Floyd and others that preceded him, you know, uh, unarmed, handcuffed, pretty much subdued, on you know, the ground, on yeah. the ground, was murdered by, I have to say, by four officers. You know, the one that had the knee, the two that were sitting on him, and the one that was, um, you know, not doing anything. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think we gotta, we gotta ask ourselves sometimes, where are we? not doing anything. Yeah. Where are we seeing something or hearing a terrible conversation, hearing a racial slur, and we don't do anything. You know, so he represents the people that see stuff, don't say anything. The man who had the knee on the neck represents just pure aggression, uh, racism, abuse of power. The two that were laying on him you know, aiding and abetting. So we, everybody has to look at themselves. Am I aiding and abetting? Do I have a knee on somebody's neck? Or am I just looking and not saying anything? I just don't want to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect me. I, it affects us all. It affects us all. And I, and I was reading some anti-racism literature, and there was a, a section in this literature talking about for white people of how to talk about this for yeah. the first time. And some of the questions were, um, and the first time you're talking about it, I'm afraid I don't know enough. Right. The second thing is I'm afraid to say the wrong thing. Right. And the third thing is I don't know what steps to take. Right. And I think, again, coming from a place of white privilege of not having to, to experience these types of systemic challenges, uh, I think this is what a lot of white people feel. They don't know how to bring it up, mm -hmm. what to say, and it's not white people's responsibility to, be ed to ask people to educate them, but it's more responsibility to do the research and do the work. Yeah. 
But what, what I guess feedback would you give to the white community on, <clears throat> you know, you I mean, know how to how to be empowered? Yeah, and not be afraid. Two, two things. One, I saw um, Jane Fonda recently speaking to this. And uh, she was being asked about it, and she's progressive, you know, climate mm -hmm. change, mm -hmm. anti-war. Yes. You know, she's spoken on a lot of issues, and she admitted that, she, you know, she was aware racism obviously exists, mm -hmm. but she was aware that she was ignorant of a lot of the ways by which brown and black people experience their life on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. The nuances. She, of the daily nuances, life, yeah. and walking into a room, suddenly you're the other, or whatever, right. you know. So she started researching. She said for the past three years, she went and got books, mm -hmm. started studying, started reading the historical <clears throat> context, the different ways that this has been perpetrated throughout the years, and she's much more sensitive to it now. Mm -hmm. Now she can speak to it. So to answer to your question, um, there, there has to be research. Yeah. Now what people need to understand is that racism Bigotry is not going to be dismantled by black and brown people. It's going to be dismantled by white people. Yeah. You know, we're pointing our finger to it. That just happened. He pulled me over for no reason. Right. I was fired even though uh, that person was hired after me or whatever. You know, we can point our finger to it. But it has to be those that have a level of privilege that actually assist in the dismantling process of that. When white people, I mean, I feel like... Hopefully I don't speak in too general terms, but I feel like millennials, most millennials, probably aren't aware of this happening. In the Midwest, they probably aren't aware. I speak for myself growing up. Right. I grew up in a small town in Ohio. Um, my dad brought in seven exchange students from around the world from five years old until I was about 10. Right. They came to live with us. He wanted us to be to see the world by not having to travel. Right, that's he brought beautiful. people from Japan, France, Germany, Brazil. Mm -hmm. So from a young age, I got to live with brothers and sisters who were 17, 18, of different cultures, right, and races. Right. But there were two moments in my life when I realized, oh, like things aren't okay in the world. One, when I was eight years old, my brother got sentenced to six to 25 years for selling drugs to an undercover cop. Mm. He got out on four and a half years on good behavior. Hmm. But I remember at eight years old, we went to go to the visiting room of the prison for the first time, where they allowed families to come in on the weekends for a certain time. And I go to the prison, and we, you know, my, my older siblings are there, my parents are there, we, we go into the prison, we're in the visiting room, and we're sitting at a table of chairs, and as I'm looking around at all the other families and inmates, we're essentially the only white people. Right. And I remember looking around thinking, huh, as an eight-year-old, like, why are we the only white people here? Right, right. You know, and that was just my first idea of like, oh, this is something happening. That's a, that's a great you awakening know? because we represent 17% of the population, but about 80 or 90% of people in jail. I know, it's in a couple Black million. people are doing all those crimes. <laughs> right, right, right. And so that was my first like, okay, I'm an eight-year-old. I'm trying to figure out who I am in the world. What is, you know, what is the world? Right. You know, what am I? I'm a being. I'm growing. And I noticed this. The second blatant instant was when I was uh, living in Huntsville, Alabama in the mm -hmm. south. Mm -hmm. And I remember driving from Columbus, Ohio to Huntsville, Alabama. And as I crossed the border from Tennessee to Alabama, I noticed Confederate flags. Mm -hmm. And I noticed I was driving behind a pickup truck that had a Confederate flag and a shotgun hanging in the back of the pickup truck. And I went to go play arena football mm -hmm. uh, in Huntsville, Alabama. I was one of the few white guys and right. all black guys. Right, right. And just hanging out with them for six months, all my friends, teammates, and going into the restaurants and going to stores and driving with them, just noticing and hearing these stories, I go, huh, like this stuff doesn't happen to me. Right. And I don't have this type of anxiety or fear. Right. And those, those kind of two moments stick out for me as, wow, there's an issue and there's a problem that I have never had to face, and white people have, we might have faced other problems. Right, everybody has issues. That. Yeah, right. but we don't face this. Yeah, right, that's just, yeah, so those are, those are wake up moments for you. We actually Huge. had a direct experience of something. As I, w I, was, I was saying earlier, we represent approximately 17% of the population. In the U.S.? In the U.S. And how many, what's but, the population in prison? About 80, 90% per people of color. Mm. Now, we're not, doing all those crimes. Everybody else is not innocent, you know what I mean? But we're targeted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, can, you, I remember going in department stores and you right away, somebody's following you thinking you're gonna steal something. 
I'm not a thief, you know, but you're targeted. But so you having an extra eye on you. He has or... an extra eye. Here's a black guy coming in. What's he going to steal? You know, so I think we're, we're targeted because of the color, color of our skin. So, and then, you know, justice, you know, they say justice is blind. We've known that justice peaks, hmm. that justice raises up that little blindfold. And if you're black, Mexican, or poor, you get a different standard of justice than if you're white and rich. You get a harder punishment. Harder punishment. Plus, you got to plead out. You have, you have, you have many to plead people, guilty. Plead guilty. To even get a less of a... Yeah, even if, even if you're innocent, sometimes it's better to plead guilty because you're going to lose. You have a public offender. You can't afford it. You're going to probably lose if you go to the jury, which means you're going to get more time. So you had many people in jail who didn't do it, but it was just better just to plead out, get this thing over, and, uh, and move on. And that's the legal system. That's the legal system. issue that we need to fix. Yeah as well. And justice needs to be blind. You know, I was jokingly saying mm. the other day that, you know, we should have a system where when a person comes in, you don't even know what color he is. He's in a box or something. You don't see him. You, your jury can't see whether this is a white guy or a black guy. That's interesting. You know, and, and you have the defense attorney, you have the prosecutor. And it's all based on evidence. It's all based on evidence only. You're not, oh, that black guy, I know he did it. I know he did it. You know, whatever the case may be. I mean, of course, that's probably never going to happen, but I've thought, how do I make justice blind for real? That's interesting. You know, this has been happening for obviously decades. You were talking about the riots in the 90s in L.A. You were here. This has been happening for decades, but it seems to be this moment is bigger yeah. than, uh, you know, the, the, the racial marches of the past, the, the killing, the unjust killings of the past, all these things. Why this moment, in your opinion? I, it, I, think, why a, is this so I think a couple of reasons. One, things had been going on for a long time with no justice. You know, we can go, Trayvon Martin, we can go case after case after case where there wasn't any, any justice meted out. The, the police officers were never um, in, uh, uh, convicted. So I think there was a buildup of energy. And so in this particular one, right after the uh, Ahmaud Arbery killing, where he's jogging and mm -hmm. two supremacists, track him down and kill him, short period of time we have um, this happening. So I think it's a buildup of energy. And some of the um, police chiefs around the nation have been saying um, that, that George Floyd is going to change policing. I mean, these are police chiefs mm. coming out and saying that he's really going to change policing. So I think um, if you go back to 1955, when Emmett Till was killed, uh, he was from Chicago, went down to the South to visit some relatives, and a woman said that he, a white woman said that he had whistled at her. They broke into his house, took him out of the house, these guys, killed him, murdered him. That created such an outrage that it put a spark into the civil rights movement. Mm. I think this can be one of those moments wow. where you have this moral outrage because everybody is seeing, there's no if, ands, and buts about it. You know, I mean, they may- see they the may, video. They, yeah, yeah, you see the video. They may try to do some things with the autopsy and try to get a lesser sentence for the guy. But you see him sitting, you see him with his knee on there, and people are saying to him, you're killing him. He's saying, I can't breathe. He's asking for his mother. You know, he can't, get off of him, man, he can't breathe. He can't breathe. You, you're killing him. You know, he's urinating. You know, so I think that particular scene could be a watershed moment like Emmett Till was, in which people are just like, enough is enough. And we may get into some, some really, some major shifts in policing, because hiring, you have to really get into the psychology of these guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what, what background do they have? You gotta, you can't, you have to have a greater training to be a barber. That's what I heard than to be a police officer with yeah, a gun, yeah. you know. So there has to be psychological training, there has to be sensitivity training, and I'm not talking about a two-week little class. You yeah. have to really bring up to, up to, up to bear. Yeah, and I know, you know, I know there's, you know, there's a, I can only imagine the anxiety <coughs> and stress of being a police officer as well. Absolutely. Of, Cause many know, of when there are p bad people who come at you and punch you and bring out a knife where you need to react and respond. Shh, absolutely. Like, this is not that time when you can see there's no offense happening against you. There's nothing you need to defend yourself against to do something like this. Do you feel like it's more the uprising against the lack of justice after something like this happens or just the act of it happening? 
I, I think it's a, a combination of systemic racism that people feel for a long time and the lack of justice. Yeah. Those two combined. It's just like, oh, he was fired and that's it. Yeah. Right? It's not, yeah. There's no justice beyond right. that, right? Yeah. And I, so I think you, you, it becomes a powder keg. Yeah. And, and seeing somebody helpless wasn't like, I mean, you've seen situations where, and this is egregious as well, where the man is running away and he gets shot in the back and yeah, killed. Yeah. Terrible. Like, matter of fact, that police officer is doing 20 years. Right. Know, that, was, that was like one time, and one, one, out, one out of two, three times where somebody actually was, was convicted. He got 20. Um, so you see the, the buildup of that. But yeah, lack of justice, mm -hmm. and then just the, you know, this, you know, let me just say this. You know, s s some of these uh, psychological research projects have shown that by the time uh, a young black boy is seven years old, you know, he has experienced the nuance of racism so many times that he builds up a kind of a, a psychological antibody. Mm. It's like it's like a little shell. It's like a an armor. An armor that just kind of starts building and building and building. By the time the individual is seven, then he goes into ten. He has a thing. He doesn't even know what it is consciously. It has a thing to survive in the world. You know, and so. You already have to survive in the world as a human. Right. Now you have to survive plus be aware of this right. racial injustice happening all the time. Absolutely. It's funny because in December 2019, I kept thinking to myself, wow, isn't 2020 a great number? <laughs> the, year for, the year for perfect vision, the year for clarity, the year to be able to see. I think we're getting it. Right? It, isn't it? I mean, it's like, I don't think this is the best way to see it, but if this is the way to see it, then I, I'm... I'm happy that people are opening their eyes, like you said, lifting the veil. Yeah. What it, is it, the importance of healing work on the inside versus healing work on the outside? Yeah, it has to be both. So there's a conversation that I have with uh, people of color, a conversation that I have with white people. People of color, I teach them to not see themselves as victims, mm -hmm. to begin to heal the wounds and the scar tissue within themselves, mm -hmm. to come to a sense of empowerment, Go to some deep levels of forgiveness, mm. so you're not carrying the uh, the thought forms of resentment, animosity. This is deep work, though. It's not like I'm going to go forgive, you know. And and so that you begin to see yourself as, as a as an African American or a Mexican or whatever or Latino, whatever the case may be. But beyond that, you are this eternal being. You're a spiritual being, having this human incarnation. That's great work. To the, to, to, the, to the white brothers and sisters, I teach them about compassion. Compassion mm -hmm. uh, allows you to see something. You walk in somebody else's moccasins. When you went to that, we went to prison to visit your brother. You, look, you were a little kid, but you looked around and you said, something, something's odd about this. Yeah. Why is everybody in here black? You know, you start to see things from somebody else's perspective. You know, so instead of just turning a blind eye, uh, they're complaining again. Oh, they're pointing the finger again. Oh, you know, they're making excuses again. You know, you have a level of compassion. You do some research. You know, what is the, what is the history of this? So there's two conversations. And then there's a conversation we all have together uh, uh, about what you brought up at the very beginning, you know, about love and compassion and building a kind and just global society, mm -hmm. it has to be built on love. Yeah. It's not going to be built just on law itself. Just as we've had laws against slavery, we've had laws against um, Jim Crow, we had laws against segregation. Yeah. We have those laws. Sometimes they're enforced, sometimes they're not. But unless in our heart of hearts we come to an awareness mm. of what love is, mm. and it has nothing to do with the color of skin, it has something to do with who we are, spiritual beings, then you, you, you can only have an enlightened society with enlightened people. Mm. You can only have a loving society with loving people. And so laws are important. I want laws. I want to be able to say, it's illegal for you to lynch me. You know, I want that law. But there has to be something else as well, and that's the shifting of our consciousness. And that's deep work. That's why agape exists. That's why yeah. spiritual centers exist. That's why we have self-empowerment. Uh, uh, in order to go in and take full responsibility for our own life, our own perceptions, our own opinions. What opinion am I holding that's not congruent with the truth of humanity's yeah. excellence? This is, this is not an over the not, overnight, no. read one book, you're, you're, you're in. You're, you're, <laughs> you've got the healing you need. This is years, decades of 
of the work. It's work. That's what I'm hearing you say. Yeah. It's not a, you know, when I have gone through healing of deep things from my childhood, even doing workshops and a few months of therapy or what, what you may be was helpful, but it still takes years of, okay, there's triggers and you have to constantly remind yourself and have compassion and forgive and let go Absolutely. of that pain and Absolutely. that frustration. It becomes a way of life. It needs to be. It's a way not of just life. a weekend seminar. Mm. It's like this is how I live my life. You know, I, I have a level of introspection where I take responsibility for what's going on in here. You know, I, I, and I do. I work with it. You know, that's called becoming aware. You know, becoming conscious. And then I have a way of living where I'm doing that on a regular basis. You can call it prayer. You can call it meditation. You can call it um, fellowshipping with progressive, high-minded people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. People who say to themselves, you know what, I'm a, I'm a stay-at-home mom, I've got a couple of kids, I'm, a, I'm going through so many challenges in my life right now, I just lost my job, I've got no money, I don't have, I've got so many problems in my own life that problems about racial injustice or problems about women's rights or problems about gay rights, or all these other rights, I've got so much going on in my own life, I don't even have time to think about it, to educate myself, mm -hmm. to ask these questions. What would you say to people who think like that, who are just so overwhelmed with their own life? Yeah. That maybe they're like... And I would say that uh, yeah. many people are like that. Yeah. They're just, they're just in, a, in a little bit of struggle from day to day just to survive. Yeah. So I, I understand that survival ethic. And I think that if an individual, one, establish an intention, if you establish an intention mm. to this say, I'm, I'm, I'm intending to become a better version of myself. Mm -hmm. I'm intending to understand what's going on doesn't mean you have to run out tomorrow and jump in a protest mm -hmm. or uh, write a petition. But if you establish an intention, something's going to come to you based on that intention. Now, most people, as I've taught over the years, suffer from an intention deficit disorder. They don't have any intention. So they just kind of react every day to things that are going on that they stay in survival mode. But if a person wakes up and actually has an intention, the universe by law, will begin to bring into that person's life a way to fulfill that intention. A, a book may show up. A neighbor may start having a conversation with them about something. You know, you, they may see a, a special on television. They may hear us mm -hmm. <laughs> on this podcast, you know, and then say, hmm, I never thought about it that way. Let me, let me think about that. You know, but to have no intention means that you're just up for grabs at whatever the popular emotional mental contagion is mm -hmm. that's going throughout the world. We're, we're not here to live an unintentional life. So, we're, we're, so during this time in human history, we want people to establish an intention. Mm -hmm. I want to learn more about this. Mm -hmm. I want to become a better person. I want to be on the right side of history. Just, that's a good intention right there. <laughs> yeah. I want to be on the right side of history. When all this goes down, I want to be the one to say, you know what? When I, before I left the planet, I helped build a better society. It may have been just with my neighbors around my neighborhood. Doesn't mean I have to go out, you know, uh, in, into the whole world and protest. Maybe it's just the conversations I'm having with the lady across the street, mm -hmm. you know, that, and we get into a dialogue and suddenly we, oh, that's a way of looking at it. Oh my God! I need to need to think about that. Yeah, the moment to moment intention, the yeah. reflection of those moments. If you know, how should people, in your opinion, address protesting and in the moment reactions? You there's, know, there's, yeah. there's two levels. You know, one, the protest, the the peaceful protests mm -hmm. that have happened, um, is a is a proclamation that one, this has been going on too long. And that two, something must be done finally. And America has always, through the First Amendment, mm. given us, everyone, the opportunity to speak. So that should not be uh, uh, quelched at all. Then there are those who have nefarious ideas using the protest, using the protest to loot, using the protest uh, uh, to steal the narrative, mm -hmm. uh, to go into some kind of anarchy. You know, uh, I, I, I saw a video of someone that I know uh, stop, trying to stop this, this white guy in this black outfit. Mm. He, was, he was a white guy oh, and a white girl spraying Black Lives Matter 
onto um, this business. And they're saying, you're white. Yeah. You have to ask well, me if you can put that, that up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Don't do that in my name. We're yeah. not here to destroy anything. I saw too, yeah. Did you see that? I saw it, yeah. yeah. And um, so there's two levels. There's, she's saying, we're here peacefully <clears throat> protesting. Right. These people are vandalizing. It's right. not us. It's not us. So, so the, on the one level, the protests uh, keep the pedal to the metal. It's like, we're not going to forget, mm -hmm. you know, let's see justice. Not only see justice in this one case, but let's begin to see individual uh, police departments look at their policies. I mean, this, this particular guy had like 18, I don't know if they yeah, were infractions, but, com, com, yeah. Yeah, you, know, <clears throat> how, you know, listen, if you're on the job and you pat a girl on the butt, you, this is zero tolerance to that. You're fired mm -hmm. the next day. It's not like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, don't do it again. He's not got, today. You've got a pink slip today, yeah. Not today. You're, you're mm -hmm. gone, <clears throat> yeah. you know. So, so if an officer who's to enforce the law, to enforce the law, has 18 complaints and still able to carry a gun, and there's something wrong mm -hmm. with the that, system. With the system, mm -hmm. you see. So I think that some of the protest is about that, not just about that officer, but let's look at the system and begin to create a uniform way of hiring, training, and then uh, pulling out the bad apples. Because I know a lot of really beautiful police officers. Yeah, I have police officer friends. Big hearts that care about black, humanity. white. Yeah. Asian, Latin, I mean, you know, so it's not a, a condemnation on police officers, mm -hmm. but the system itself allows for the bad apples and the bad ap actors to stay and to affect other people. You know, uh, sometimes, you, you know, you may have a, a somebody that's coming <clears throat> in all one idealistic, I want to protect and serve my neighborhood, and then he gets involved with some, some bad apples, and after a while, in order for him to to stay in the club, he has to go along with the program, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, the, the system needs to be changed. I mean, for those that want to help, you know, you, you're saying white people need to make the change. We're the ones that need to make the change, right? Black people have been the ones pointing at the, the, the problem. Yeah. We're the ones that need to be allies yeah. and educating ourselves and being a stand for equality. Right. What do you think is the right balance for white people in their lives to say, okay, I'm gonna champion this, I'm gonna stand up for this because I believe in equality, I believe in equal rights, I don't wanna see my brothers and sisters have unfair right. um, things happen in the world. What is the balance between advocating, fighting, marching, protesting, standing up, posting on social media, dialoguing with their friends, calling governors, uh, mm -hmm. signing petition, what, I mean, is it? All of that is, all of that is, 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 is helpful. When you said our black brothers and sisters, first of all, that's the context. You know, we're all living in this fabric of society. So it's not just what's happening to black people. That's important, yes. But this is our society. There has to be a context that we're all in this together. Yes. So something is happening to brother over there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my society. That's my neighborhood. That's my city. You know, so I have to ask myself. This is people have to ask the sincere question. What is it that's mine to do? Everyone has gifts, talents, and capacities. Everyone uh, can't do everything, mm -hmm. but everyone can do something. So perhaps the woman that you talked about, that stay-at-home mom, she's taking care of her kids, she's trying to survive, perhaps what she can do is actually pick up the phone and call her, her, her councilman mm -hmm. and her congressman and her senator, or text him or email mm -hmm. him and say, you know what? I think what I saw was unjust. I like to see justice. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps that's what she can do. Right. Perhaps someone else, like we were talking about millennials earlier, uh, they have the energy to go out. March all night. In March, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and, and the beautiful thing about millennials are this. Because of, the, because of music and because of social media. Dance. Well, and dance. Yeah. Millennials, a lot of them, not all. Not, you know, like you said, we don't want to be too generalized. They, they don't have a, they, they, the racism and the homophobia, it's not a big thing to many millennials. That's just, you know, you know that's my girlfriend. Yeah, you, yeah. you know, that's my, you know. They don't, uh, they, they've come a lot, so they have to take leadership. They're more open-minded. They're way, yeah. way more open-minded than people that grew up in the 50s, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I, I would say everybody can't do everything, but everybody can do something. 
So everyone has to be sincere with themselves and say, what is it that's mine to do? Mm -hmm. You know, you have a podcast. You're, you're opening up your podcast to have this dialogue. Hopefully, one thing that we say may make somebody go, hmm, hmm, hmm. Let me see what I can do, mm -hmm. you know. So everybody has something. There's no one that doesn't have anything, yeah. you know. Again, from the neighbor across the street right. to a petition to writing a congressperson to being on the streets to my, 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 some of my security people who are on the streets stopping people from looting. I mean, they can do that <laughs> because they're very strong martial artists, you know, yep. ex-sheriffs, I mean, they, they can handle themselves in the street, you know, so their job, they went out at night and stopped people from looting. They saved eight businesses, right. eight that were about to be burned. You know, they were able to stop that. That's what they could do, and that's what they did. Mm -hmm. Now, the woman staying at home, I wouldn't ask her to do that. Right. <laughs> you better stay at home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do your part. Do the your part. The skills and talents you have. Right. One of the he things I'm hearing from all people is, who is leading this charge? Is there a leader organizing like the actual steps that we can do, like action as opposed to- There's no hierarchy in this People are this time. peacefully um, marching, people are rioting, people are doing this, people are posting. We're only one week out of this right. happening still. Right. So I think there's a lot of confusion for people and just also three months locked indoors, it's like this anger and resentment and frustration. It's like now we're just getting out. Yeah and unleashing all the energy of three months Even inside. from that, right, 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 right. I, I think that um, that's the <clears throat> next step. Like right now you have the, the anger of the unheard, mm -hmm. the protest for justice. Now there has to be strategy. There are some people that have strategy. I mean, they're not necessarily on the news, yes. but there are people in, um, in the legal um, aspect of life that are working on strategy and, ha and please, and have been working on strategy, have been uh, doing things to try to push the needle forward. You For know, decades. Van yeah, Jones, yeah. I mean, there's a yeah, lot of yeah, people yeah. doing work, mm -hmm. you know, and I think um, good news mm -hmm. is that that mm -hmm. work will probably speed up. The bad news is that there are people that are impatient saying, what you've been doing hasn't been working mm -hmm. because here another person has been killed. So I think that uh, we have to be more vocal with the strategy and with the plan. And we have to look at Justice Department, we have to look at uh, the uh, prison industrial system, you have to look at the sick care system masquerading as a health care system that again is run on greed. If a, uh -huh. if a poor person goes to the hospital, it's not going to get the same treatment as a, a person who has the greatest insurance in the world. Right. You know, so all these systems are up for change. So many systems to, to, to put energy behind to try to change, right? right. And all based on profit <clears throat> motive, not necessarily humanity, <laughs> you yeah. know. So again, the veil is lifted, so now we see it all. When, when COVID came through, it revealed that the most vulnerable people in our society have the least access to the resources. We knew, we knew it, but COVID revealed it. Yes. You know, so we-, we 40 million we, unemployment, uh, you know, all this stuff, yeah. It's all, it's, all, it's all there. So I think that if everybody asks, what is it that I can do? And then very importantly, we have to be able to articulate, this is where strategy comes in, you have to be able to articulate what the kind and just global society looks like, what the system, what the ideal looks like. Then you begin to strategize as to how to get there. Mm -hmm. So right now there's a lot of dialogue about what isn't working. There's no justice here, the most vulnerable aren't taken care of. So you have to move from that to what does it look like? to take care of the most vulnerable? What does it look like to have a real health care system? Mm -hmm. What does it look like to have a real justice system? So that has to be articulated. Without vision, people perish. Yes. So if you don't have a vision of where you're walking, then you're just kind of walking in circles. You know? So you have all these different steps. There are people who are visionary, people who can articulate the vision, people who are good at strategy, people who are good at doing the work. Execution, yeah. You know, all, everybody's important. Yes. Everybody's important. So I want to go back to these three questions that <clears throat> white people are, you know, asking in general. I'm afraid I don't know enough. I'm afraid to say the wrong things and offend people. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what steps to take. Yeah. For me, if I could end this today, yeah. like as a, as a man of white privilege of never going through this injustice, 
Like, I don't want this to happen. So I want to know what I could do if I could do it today. And I think a lot of white people, I don't want to speak in general terms, but a lot of people, white people I know, they don't want this either. So nobody you know, wants like, it. We're ready to do the work. Now, mm -hmm. like once we figure out the right strategy, we'll execute. Well, here's the deal. You know, you're talking about white privilege. That's a big step. Yeah. Primarily because it's never been, it's never been acknowledged before. Yeah. You know, I was having a conversation with a woman in, in Agape about it. And, you know, she kind of knew about it, but at the same time, it wasn't blatant. A white woman. Yeah. Yeah. And then something happened. Her son stole, um, well, let's say borrowed, her and her husband's car in the middle of the night. They were asleep, and he snuck into the garage, mm. stole the car, went and picked up his boys. Yeah, did something around town. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and got pulled over by the police. And they said, go home. Ooh. They said, get a license? He's like 14, 15 years old. He said, no, sir. He said, you don't have a license? He said, no. Whose car is this? My dad's. Oh, and he looked in the back seat. What are you guys doing? Smoking weed? Two, two white guys in the back seat. With a white guy in the front. He says, you guys go home right now. Mm. Now, if that would have been four black guys, they would have been, they would have been, they had, a, they had their first record. Mm -hmm. Fingerprints, in jail, you know. So I told her, this is a really good opportunity, a teaching moment for you to teach your son about white privilege. Mm. That if he would have been a black guy driving and gotten pulled over, it would have been a totally different scenario. So she's taken, she is starting conversations with white women about white privilege. She mm -hmm. has felt compelled to do that, you know. For white people who, I mean, we, in general, again, there's been other challenges we've faced, right? People have their own challenges, but we've never had to face these types of challenges. We've gotten off, we've, you know, let, like, had a pass, we've had all these different things where we don't, fear for our lives if we get in trouble that we're going to get shot and killed. We don't right. have that type of fear. And it's, it, I think it's hard for people to have perspective unless they see it like they're seeing it now. Yeah. So, but they still are, I mean, if you haven't felt it, how do you gain that perspective? If, you, if you're never like, well. You got, you, got, you, got to, you got to do what Jane Fonda said. You really got to be interested in study. And you have to say to people of color, I don't, you can say, I don't want to offend. Yeah. Uh, but I do want to be educated. Yeah. I do want to have this conversation. I mean, you called me yeah. and said, hey, I want to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, let's have this conversation. You know, I wasn't offended. I said, yeah, <laughs> let's, let's have it. You know, uh, and I think people are nervous, but you know what? We have to get over that, yeah. that, that skittishness. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll tell you an experience. I was in um, South Africa. Uh, I've been many times, but I was there before Nelson Mandela was president, elected. And they'd called me over to lead vision process throughout the country because they'd been fighting against apartheid for so long that they had lost the vision of how they wanted their society to be. Mm -hmm. This is what some of the people who were bringing me over saying. So I went over with about a number of my spiritual practitioners, small choir, and I was doing the vision process around the nation. And we were in Soweto, our choir practicing with the Soweto choir. So that was the, during the time Soweto was listed as the most violent city in the world, okay? And all of a sudden, the assistant choir director comes into the room and says, quick, get all the white people out of here. The rebels are coming to get them. And my people started laughing. Because, you know, my inter it was an integrated choir. My yeah, choir is yeah. integrated. And, I, and they started laughing. I said, he's serious. I said, everybody get on the bus. So everybody got on the bus. I said, white folks, get under the seat. No way. Yeah. Black people sit on the seat. So the white people are hiding under the seat. The black people are sitting on the seat so nobody could see them under there. You know, had their blankets over their legs and everything. And, and it's very tense. So I got up to the front and got in the microphone. I had to break the ice a little bit. So I said, listen, if they come in here looking for the white people, I'm going to say, these white people belong to me. You know? Oh, my goodness. So everybody started laughing, you know. <laughs> and we were driving out of Soweto in bus loads of these individuals coming with guns and all kinds of stuff were coming into Soweto. We were going out. So all, all that, because he was black people in the bus. So they, you know, we, we got out, got back to the hotel and processed all night. The white people had never had a direct experience wow. of being a minority, never had a direct experience of their life being on the line. This is how black people had been living for decades. Right. You know what I mean? And, and it changed 
many of them. I mean, they still go to Agape now, and it shifted their perspective because they had a direct experience of what it felt like to be the other and to have your life threatened. So I wouldn't advocate that for everybody, but... Maybe a simulated training in school <laughs> of like history. I, like, I thought about that over the years, you know, like having people just move through the experience, have men move through the experience of harassment, right. of what it feels like. You know, have, have, have white people move through the experience of what it feels like to, you know you're not gonna be hired, you know, move through the experience of, you're gonna be fired first when it's time to be fired. Right. Move through the experience of a police officer, you know, you, you're, you're driving and you, you're probably gonna be pulled over if you're driving at night and you're the only one, you know, or, or whatever. But, but I think that that's what compassion is. Part of compassion is being able to walk in the moccasins of another per person. So it can be done mentally, viscerally, emotionally, you know. How would you feel if, it's really like this, how would you feel if, if George Floyd was your brother? Mm. That was your dad. He had two children, mm. you know. Because that was you. You know, you have to, people have to get a sense of that, that births compassion, you know. So I would say, one, don't be afraid of having the conversation. This is the time to have the conversation, you know. And you, have to, you don't have to complete everything in one conversation. Right, right. But if you just open the door, then that becomes territory that you can talk about. Because yeah. before, you might only be talking about sports, or you might only be talking about that latest movie that you saw on Netflix or whatever. Now, <clears throat> That territory is open, and if I see Lewis, I see so and so. We can we can talk about it. We can have yeah. conversation and have greater insights. I think one of the things that I've seen in the last week <clears throat> since all this, all this has come about on social media is I think people are afraid to people who are afraid who are on the right side to speak up mm -hmm. for being judged one way or another for saying the wrong things for people being shamed for doing it the wrong way or yeah. I feel like certain people feel judged like no matter what I do or say I'm gonna get attacked yeah and I think you need to overcome like it's gonna happen it's gonna, it's gonna happen you're gonna be judged for oh you're just doing this to do it or do you really care or you put the wrong hashtag or you, right it's like you don't actually you aren't really educated right I think you just got to be willing to say I'm gonna get judged uh, you're gonna be People are not going to like you. People right. are going to be upset at you. You're going to offend people. You're going to hurt people. And I think going back to your point of intention, right. it's like if you have the right intention and you know you're doing the work and you're doing your best, you say, hey, I'm trying to figure this out. Like, I'm going to make mistakes, but I want to be on the right side. Right. So let me know if I can be better. Right. I think you got to take that approach. Absolutely. As, 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 it's called courage. You have to have It's not a, fun to get no. criticized constantly. There are haters out there. Mm -hmm. If you go on your social media and write the word blue, they're going to say, blue, <laughs> green. <laughs> no, it's green. Right. And there's always haters <laughs> that are looking for an argument and looking to put somebody down. They're there. They're there. It's going to happen. Know, it's going to happen. They, don't, they, they have a, a low level of self-esteem. Many of them aren't doing anything with their own life. They're haters there. So, yes, if you try anything new, yeah. you're going to be hated. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've said over the years that mediocrity attacks excellence. Ooh. <laughs> That's what it yeah. does. Mediocrity always attacks excellence. Mm. So if you start walking towards excellence, mediocrity is going to rise up and say, what the hell, who do you think you are? Why do you think you can have a big podcast? What do you th how do you think you can change? What are you doing? You can't do that. You it came from this kind of family. No, no. You know, mediocrity is going to attack it, but you keep on going. And then after a while, mediocrity and the <clears throat> haters create a level of resistance that allow you to go higher. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how, what, what life is, you know, uh, whatever negative energy is coming at you, if you lift your vibration, you actually use it to go beyond. So at the end of the day, you thank the haters. You elevated me. <laughs> yeah, you elevated me. <laughs> you, 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 you brought deep forgiveness in my heart. You made me pray when I didn't feel like it. You made me uh, 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 mm. finalize my vision when I was being lazy. Mm. You made me learn how to articulate better because of your hate coming in my direction. You chiseled me into a better person. Yeah. Whereas if, if it would have been just an uh, open door with no challenge, 
because we're not here to live a challenge-free life. Challenges make us strong. Mm -hmm. So the haters are just part of the challenge. Mm -hmm. So we can't just sit back and say, oh, well, that's like saying, well, when I get over my fear, then I'm going to do something. No, 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 no. You're not trying to get over your fear. You walk in the direction, and then fear becomes excitement, mm. and then excitement becomes enthusiasm. But it doesn't change unless you're actually walking in the direction. Yeah. yeah. What's a mantra all human beings can have yeah. in this time of like getting back to intention? Okay, okay. The, the mantra and the affirmation first have to come from context. context. Our context determines our perception. So our context must be, I am here to contribute to a kind and just global society. Yeah. You know, so that's the context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not, my context isn't, I'm just trying to get rich, or I'm just, I'm just trying to be successful. That's within a context of, I am here to participate and help create a kind and just global society. So if I have that context, then I can say, um, let me be an instrument of peace. Mm, that could be the mantra. Yeah, let me be an instrument of compassion. Let me be an instrument of intelligence and joy, whatever quality is relevant at that particular moment. Today, it would probably be peace and justice. Let me be an instrument of peace and justice, you see. So everybody can say that. Yeah. Yeah. No matter if you're white, black, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. That can be the mantra. Yeah. Tiffany, who's filming behind us, asked, how can we be comfortable being uncomfortable during this time? knowing that we're trying to heal and trying to get back to a place of normalcy, but we may never be normal again. Mm -hmm. First of all, we don't want to go back to normal. We mm -hmm. don't want to go back to the status quo. The status quo is where systemic racism lives and where injustice lives. So this is an opportunity, this flashpoint is an opportunity to change the normal and to change the status quo so that peace and justice begins to prevail in, in mm -hmm. all of our institutions. Now, if you're walking in the direction of greatness, you walk in the direction of excellence, you're going to be uncomfortable. If you want to be an Olympic athlete, you got to get up early in the morning, you got to work out, you got to be uncomfortable for, for years, for years, periods of time of intensity in order to make those breakthroughs in your mind. Same thing with society. If in fact we're really going to dismantle racism, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be easy to say, uh, today, I don't, you know, I'm just going to go to work. I'm going to get my paycheck. I'm going to fund my retirement program. I'm going to go to the baseball game and whenever we can go back to the baseball game. You know, it's easy to do that. But I, if I really want to be about a kind and just global society, I'm going to have to be uncomfortable. That means I'm going to have to sacrifice my time. Sacri the word sacrifice means to make sacred. Mm. So I'm going to have to make sacred my time which means this period of time I'm going to make sacred by either having an uncomfortable conversation or calling my congressperson or fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be uncomfortable because no one changes the status quo and remains comfortable. Right. You Sitting know? on your couch, no, you, watching you, TV. No, yeah. eating potato chips and getting fat. No, no. You, <laughs> you, 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 got, you got to be uncomfortable. You know, you, 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 you know this. Mm -hmm. Talk to anyone who has made any changes in society, whether they're an inventor, uh, whether they're a dancer, whether they're an athlete, whether they're a business person, they were uncomfortable. They had to do stuff that other people were unwilling to do. Yeah, progress takes pain. Yes. It takes pain and... Sweet pain. Sweet pain. It was like... Lovely pain. Yeah, when I'm in the gym and that guy's... It's, it's it hurts. sweet pain. <laughs> you know, I'm doing that yoga. I'm holding that posture for Ooh. that asana for another 30 Ooh, seconds. Back. Sweet. You know, so it's the same type of thing. We're not here to live a comfortable life. Yeah. Matter of fact, the comfort zone is your enemy. Yeah. You know? That's, that your enemy is the comfort zone because the good that we're seeking is outside of our present paradigm. It's in the realm of the unknown. Mm -hmm. That's where the good is. So you have a vision, you walk in that direction. What you don't know, you don't know shows up. You realize you didn't know that. You learn it and you keep on moving. So we're not, we're not, we don't, we're not here to make people comfortable. Yeah. We're here to make, make people great. <laughs> mm, love that. <laughs> Thank you for, for sharing all this. And I think this is a great start to a dialogue for my audience. And I think my audience can, will have a lot of resources for people in the show notes to dive in on more of what our team has been educating ourselves on. But you have an amazing 
service you provide for people every week at Agape, where they can find he- uh, spiritual healing. They can find a community of right, people right, to right. share and create a safe dialogue with. They can learn on how to heal from this, but just lots right. of things in their life. And right now you guys are doing Zoom, is right. that right? You're doing yes. live stream, Zoom. Where live stream can... and Zoom. And where, where can we go um, to be a part of this? I, I've been there before, it's amazing. Yeah. And I know a lot of people that go there religiously every week yeah. to, to listen to you and the community you bring of, of experts to share. Where, where can we go and, and get a place of healing, of intentional love, of community? I like that, intentional love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, on the website, they can go to agapelive.com. Every Sunday, 645, 830, 11, they can see the services. The first service is a meditation service. I teach mm, I meditation. Love I love this. Yeah. And then the next two service carries the inspirational message aspect of life. And when they go to the website, beginning just in just a few days, there's going to be dialogues around people will be able to express without judgment, whatever it is that they're feeling during this time, whether it's COVID, whether it's racism, police brutality, without judgment, mm-hmm. in order to develop a higher dialogue. That's going to be um, facilitated by one of my practitioners, Aisha Mason, and others who are trained mm. in having this kind of dialogue. So it's trained people that know how to create a safe space. That's going to be up in just a couple of days. If they go to agapelive.com, they can get on the Zoom and actually be a part of that dialogue. I just released an app. It's free. Right. You know, you can up, up level if you want, but it's a free app that's going to have inspiration, spiritual practices. Mm. They can go to michaelbbeckwith.tv, subscribe to the app, and then go to the app store, Beckwith Inspires, MBB, and actually get the app. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be putting things on that on a regular basis. So right on your phone, you'll be able to wow. get whatever the latest practice is based on whatever's going on in the world at that yeah. particular time. Wow. On my Instagram Live, you know, I'm having um, dialogues. I mean, I, 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 stuff's there all the time, but I've been having dialogues about this issue with people. I have one up there now with uh, Ayan Levan Zant, Kevin mm-hmm. Ross, and um, Ryan Bathe, and, and Ben Crump mm-hmm. came on to talk about what's going on right now. Yeah. So if they go to my Instagram, so there's stuff on Instagram, stuff on my YouTube page, yep. there's stuff on the website, michaelbeckwith.com. They can get the app there. So we're trying to provide as much as we can Mm -hmm. to keep people inspired and out of fear because here's the deal. We talk about the COVID virus, but the bigger virus is the virus of the mind, which is fear. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest virus. Now we know that the virus is not as deadly as was being taught because thousands of people have had it. You know, when you look at the the, the research that's been done by these universities, back in 2019. Mm. So that brought the mortality rate really low. So um, the biggest virus is fear. Yeah. People are dying of fear. Yeah, the F word. Yeah. So definitely we want people to wash their hands. We want people to wear masks when necessary. We want people to eat right, build up their immune system. I mean, if your immune system is strong, you know, that needs, <laughs> I'll just say this, they're trying to mandate a bunch of stuff. They need to mandate that people take their vitamin C right. every day. Exactly. <laughs> they need to mandate that they take yeah. their vitamin D. They yeah. need to mandate that they go outside and take their shoes off and get in the ground so they get new microbes so the mm-hmm. immune system starts to work. Because what's dangerous is that people are at home quarantining and they're not getting any new microbes and new germs to fight. The immune system shuts down. Yeah. I know this isn't what we're supposed to be talking right. about. <laughs> but, but anyway, all of that will be on my, my website. Yeah. How do the immune system to stay strong spiritually, mentally, mm-hmm. and physically? Yeah, the answer, the answer, you've got a lot of books. I like this one. I like short books because I'm a slow reader. But the answer is you is a good one. Heart Sets and Mindsets for Self-Discovery. You've got tons of resources, tons of books, tons of programming. And again, I love that you lead this weekly meditation for people to get back to a place of peace inside we talk yeah. about healing on the inside first you can start to heal the outside right, right it's hard to make change on the outside if you're not coming back to a place of peace and love and centeredness which you provide people every single week uh, live and also through the app how else can we support you in this mission you know what you, you support me support agape by actually doing your inner work if you tune in and i tell people if you tune in you listen and you actually just take one thing and practice it that week, you will see your life change. Mm -hmm. We're not here to be a bystander. 
We're here to be a participant. Mm -hmm. So if you hear something in this conversation, you say, well, I can do that. Yeah. You don't have to do everything. But if you take one thing and you actually do it, I tell people to do it, do this for seven days. And then next week you'll hear something else. Actually practice it for seven days. Don't just say, oh, that was good. I liked it the way he said that. Implement. You know, yeah, yeah, just yeah. actually do it. That's how you help. Because what are you doing? You're building a better being. It means you're building a better neighborhood, mm -hmm. a better city, better state, better nation. Yeah. So I, I, I teach, I'm not here to gain followers. I'm here to train spiritual leaders. Mm. I'm not looking for followers. This follow back with, no, I'm not, I'm not, that's not my thing. My thing is to train people to be leaders and to realize they have an inner authority within themselves. They, they, are, they, are, they could be just as tapped into the wisdom and the guidance and the intelligence that anyone is tapped into because this presence that's never an absence doesn't make special people. Yeah. It makes everyone with equal access to the wisdom and the love and the peace, but you have to participate in it. You have yeah. to actually, you know, we can, all, we can all be at the ocean and say, oh, we all have access to going swimming, but if you don't get in, <laughs> you're not going to get wet. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so we all have access. You got to dive in. You got to you gotta dive in, man. That's it. So, you know, they, if they go to the, the website or Agape's Facebook page, mm -hmm. they can see how to support us. Got it's it. very, very okay. easy. There's ways to donate, there's ways to keep our ministries going, sure, sure. all of that. And, and we definitely are open to that, particularly now <laughs> during this time. Yeah. You know, and just to, we, we have... Um, Morning prayer time at 8 a.m. Pacific time mm. on the web. Every day? Every single day. Wow. You can go right on Agape's Facebook page. I have a practitioner leading that every day at wow, 8 a.m. that's cool. Noon meditation every day. Wow. Uh, on the Facebook page. Friday night community gathering, 5.30 p.m. Pacific time every Friday. Mm. People are tuning in from all around the world. We have youth programs every Sunday. You know, so we're trying to be full service to keep the virus of fear mm. out of people's minds come back to hope, hope goes to faith, and then faith goes to conviction. Mm. Yeah. If you guys want to hear the previous interview we did, which has been one of my favorites on the podcast, uh, I think it was about a year and a half ago we had you on. Yeah. And yeah. if you want to hear uh, Michael's three truths and uh, his answer to the three truths question, his definition of greatness, make sure to go listen to that or watch that on YouTube. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for being a leader of love, of faith, of peace during this time, and uh, I hope we can do more. Hopefully, we'll do, maybe we'll do an Instagram live here soon after this comes out, and we'll Why talk not? about this more. So, let's, let's keep the conversation going. We're just getting started. Thank you for the invitation. Appreciate you, brother. Thanks. Thank you so much for watching this interview with Michael Beckwith. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe, leave a comment below, and like this video, and check out my last interview with Kevin Hart, also right here. There are no easy roads. Yeah. So when I was coming up and I'm not getting the auditions, or I'm not getting the opportunities, I had to say to myself, it's going to come.